Namaste. Healthy greetings to all sisters and brothers that are joining us today from different corners of the world and India to commemorate together the Foundation Day of the Theosophical Society. We share with you the best wishes and happiness to be gathered for this occasion. To start our program, I request Shikar, please, to make the universal invocation. Thank you, Catalina. Namaste. Hearty greetings to all. Let us come together in heart and mind to invoke that universal principle, the spark of which lives in each and every one of us. O oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. O oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. O oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May all who feel themselves as one with thee know they are therefore one with every other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shikar. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to invite Ms. Maria Artama, International Secretary of the Theosophical Society, who is going to address to us with the welcome words. Please, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Catalina. Dear members and friends of Theosophy, we are celebrating the 146th uh, anniversary of the Theosophical Society, which means that it was founded in 1875, as we all know very well, I'm sure. The Theosophical Society was formed in a series of six meetings in New York City. Uh, those gatherings started in September and would continue until November 17, which is the official day of the founding in New York in 1875. Although others were present on that memorable November uh, day, SPB Blavatsky, Colonel Henry Steele Olcott, and William Judge, Quinn Juan Judge, are considered to be the three principal founders. Today we will hear about all the three of which William Judge is not that familiar. So we have interesting to listen to. The society was to be truly eclectic and uh, without distinctions, emphasizing unity and uh, brotherhood at, uh, at the first place. Let us keep it in that way, open to sincere studies to widen our understanding of the magnificent life in the midst of miseries and hardships of people. It is important to bring light to the world and help humanity to find its real essence. Welcome to commemorate the founders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And now moving with today's program, uh, we are going to share with you a uh, very special message that uh, the Vice President of the Theosophical Society, Mrs. Deepa Padi, uh, has sent to us. So now I'm going to proceed to share the screen. So all of us can watch the video. Second. <clears throat> mm. 
Namaste, brothers and sisters, my warm greetings to all of you. Today, that is November 17th, is an auspicious occasion and a day of great significance. It is the day when the divine seed of Theosophical Society was planted in New York in 1875 by our great leaders of Theosophy, Madam H. P. Blavatsky and Cornell H. Alcott. It is that tiny seed which germinated and grew into an organization with the thousands of members, several branches and sections in 70 countries worldwide. The growth of the society depends very much on our committed and sincere members. Today is also the day when we need to ask ourselves, where do we stand? What are we really aiming for? The forces and the currents of thought required for bringing a change in the world are already set in motion by our founders with the masters behind them from the subtle planes but good channels in the outer world are necessary for their expression. This is possible when members transform themselves in their thoughts, perceptions, and attitude and fulfill the mission of Theosophical Society of serving humanity. This is also the need of the hour. On this day, let us pay our humble tribute to the twin founders for their self-sacrifice, hard work of years for the society and seek their divine guidance in our thoughts and actions. Thank you. Thank you to our Vice President Deepa Padi for such inspiring and motivating words that she shared with us today. Now I want to invite Professor Shinde, who is going to introduce our today's speaker, Ms. Nancy Secrets. Professor Shinde, please. Good morning, brothers and sisters and wish you a happy foundation or Founders Day, 17th November, 2021. I am really grateful to organizers for giving me this honor to introduce Sister Nancy Secrets, the international treasurer and resident of Adyar. In fact, she is in the Theosophical Society as a financial nucleus extending because she is always ready to extend helping hands to needy both in Theosophical Society as well as in the Theosophical Order of Service through the world, throughout the world under the guidance of our uh, most efficient president Kim Boyd. Let me tell you, she is not only the international treasurer of the Theosophical Society, but also she is serving as the international treasurer of the Theosophical Order of Service and working most efficiently day and night. We all experience her efficiency during lockdown period and also her nature of affection, especially in relationship with all the workers and her nature of togetherness attitude in the campus. Well, looking at her biodata, which says she is a certified public accountant by profession, she lived and worked at Crotona Spiritual Institute, United States of America, that is 
California one year and later she became national secretary of the Theosophical Society in America, Wheaton, from 1988 to 1990. It is interesting to know how she get involved in the Theosophical Society at her youth, that is at the age of 21. She happened to visit a local bookshop owned by a Theosophist who very kind enough put a copy of at the feet of the master into her bag of purchase. And as we know, Sister Nancy says that this book contains all the basis or whatever basics needed to know the progress on the path of self-unfoldment. And she has been studying metaphysics since her childhood. She had this open mind to go deep into this small book by Alcyon. The fact is that she has been blessed to have known and learned from the amazing people throughout her life. And it is because of her learning mind. She is also an international speaker of the Theosophical Society and traveled and even traveling except this pandemic period in the United States, America, Europe, Asia, giving presentations, talks, and workshops. Being TOS International Treasurer, looking the work of TOS around the world, providing them financial help as well. Her articles and some of her talks have been published in the Theosophical, in the Theosophist and other Theosophical publications. And today on this Founders Day, Sister Nancy will speak on three founders, Madam H.P. Blavatsky, Colonel H.S. Salcott, and W.Q. Judge, who were really active in the formation of the TS at New York. As we know, W.Q. Judge and H.P.B. together drafted the preliminary memorandum and rules of the esoteric section. And all of them had first-hand experience of receiving master's messages who are helping the theosophical work invisibly. With these words, I introduce Sister Nancy to you all, and I now request her to share her thoughts on three founders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shindy, for those kind words. Um, and greetings to everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever, whatever time it is where you're at. We were very, very happy to see you here today. The Theosophical Society was founded in New York City in the United States on November 17, 1875 uh, by Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, Colonel Henry Steele Alcott, and William Kwan Judge, and others. There were actually 17 signers of the original document. And today we're going to talk about those three. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky was born on August 12th, 1831 in Ekaterinoslav, Russia, uh, which is now uh, Dnipropetrovsk or Dnipro uh, in the Ukraine. She was the eldest of four children of Colonel Peter von Hahn and Helena Andreevna de Fadeva, Fadevia, the, the daughter of Princess Helena Dolgorukov. These, these names are killers. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, HPB was born into a noble family 
1849, at the age of 18, she married Nikifor V. Blavatsky, a state official who was quite a bit older than her. Now, I've always heard this, that he was a lot older than her. And in my mind, pictured an old man, 60, 70 years old. Recently, I read, read, read a biography of Blavatsky written by Gary Lachman. And he said in there that she, he was twice her age, which is considerably older, especially if you're 18. But if she was 18 and he was twice her age, he was 36 which is not an old man. He's really in the prime of his life, but still older than her. Their marriage was short-lived, only a few months, after which she began traveling. It was said that she fought in Garibaldi's army, disguised as a man, and that she was injured. She also traveled to Tibet twice, where she spent time studying with her master. In the preface to HPB Teaches, an anthology, Michael Gomes, the compiler, says, quote, with a title like HPB Teaches, the reader may wonder, teaches what? HPB herself gives the answer. Metaphysics, psychology, philosophy, ancient religions, zoology, natural sciences. One might also add, occult symbolism, spiritual evolution, guidance on moral and social issues, after-death states, cycles on human destiny. Aside from the major books she is famous for, Isis Unveiled, 1877, The Secret Doctrine, 1888, The Key to Theosophy and Voice of the Silence, 1889, it is estimated that in a brief span of 17 years, from 1874, she was 43 at that time, to 1891, Madame Blavatsky wrote close to 1,000 articles, essays, and letters of a few pages on the topics listed above, close quote. From those who have studied HPB's life, we know that writing was in her blood as her mother, grandmother, and sisters were all writers. We know that she was a willful yet sensitive child. And we know that she was unusual in that she possessed certain psychic abilities. Of HPB's many gifts, I find her linguistic skills very impressive. Learning a new language is not easy, especially as an adult. Yet HPB learned English in a relatively short time. Now, I wrote those sentences a couple of years ago, actually. And I have since learned, again from Gary Lockman's book, that HPB actually learned English as a child from her, uh, I guess it would be her governess. But still, I find this impressive that she would write these major tomes in uh, a language that was not her first language. Okay, I find this, okay, an amazing accomplishment. And what did she write? Not just anything. She wrote on highly abstract. She wrote on highly abstract and complex topics, such as cosmogenesis and anthropogenesis, citing ancient texts. She wrote of the science of her day with knowledge and gave explicit explanations of, the, of many of its aspects. She wrote on religion and its shortcomings, comparing it to the ancient or divine wisdom, theosophy. She and Alcott met at the Eddy Farm in Vermont in 1874. Along with William Kwan Judge, she, Alcott, and others founded the Theosophical Society on November 17, 1875. She was 44 at that time. She died in London on May 8, 1891, at the age of 60. Henry Steele Alcott was an agriculturist. 
American military officer, journalist, lawyer, and co-founder of the Theosophical Society. Colonel Alcott was a descendant of a family that had settled in America many generations earlier. His father, Henry Wyckoff Alcott, and his mother, Emily Steele, were both of New York City. He was born in Orange, New Jersey, USA, on August 2nd, 1832, the eldest of six children. During his early years, he was absorbed in agricultural experimentation and was considered an agricultural expert by the age of 26. He became associate agricultural editor of the New York Times Tribune, which position he held until 1860, thereby beginning his journalistic career. Also, in 1860, he married Mary Epley Morgan. They had four children, but unfortunately, only two sons survived infancy. In 1862, he enlisted in the Northern Army and fought during the American Civil War until he became ill and was sent to New York for recuperation. Colonel Alcott possessed extraordinary courage, both physical and moral. And it was during this period of his life that this characteristic began to show itself strongly. Instead of returning to active service in the army, the government asked him to conduct an inquiry into suspected frauds. For four years, in the face of the most active opposition, Alcott continued this investigation despite threats, false accusations, and offers of bribes. At the end of that time, he had secured enough evidence to result in the conviction of the leading criminal. Colonel Alcott repeated these services for the War Department and two years later, the Navy Department. In both of these appointments, he distinguished himself. Receiving again the highest praise from the heads of both departments and the added comment, quote, that you have thus escaped with no stain upon your reputation when we consider the corruption, audacity, and power of the many villains in high position whom you have prosecuted and punished is a tribute of which you may be well proud, may well be proud, close quote. Colonel Alcott had been admitted to the bar in 1868, and at the end of his government service, he entered private practice as a lawyer. During all these years, Colonel Alcott had been interested in spiritualism, and in 1874, he was asked to take a special assignment for the New York Graphic to report the psychic phenomenon at the Eddy Farm in Vermont. This is in the USA. As a result of this experience, he published his second book, People from the Other World. It was at Chittenden, Vermont, while well, he was on this assignment that he met H.P. Blavatsky, who had come there on instructions from her master. Joining forces with her, from this point onward, the work he worked to carry out the purposes of the Brotherhood of Adepts, especially those purposes related to the specific mission assigned to Madame Blavatsky by her master. Alcott later wrote in Old Diary Leaves, quote, bound together by the unbreakable ties of a common work, the master's work having mutual confidence and loyalty and one aim in view, we stand or fall together, close quote. Of their personal relationship, Colonel Alcott says, neither then at the commencement nor ever afterwards had either of us the sense of the other being of the opposite sex. We were simply chums, so regarded each other, so called each other. 
William Kwan Judge was born in Dublin on April 13, 1851. He was brought up a Methodist, but early showed strong occult tendencies. The family migrated to New York in 1864. Judge became a naturalized American citizen at 21. He worked as a clerk at an early age as he had to be self-supporting. He married in 1874 and had one daughter who died of diphtheria in 1876. At the time of the reformation, at the time of the formation of the society, he was a law clerk in the office of the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. He later, he was later admitted to the New York Bar in 1872 and made a specialty of commercial law. He was modest, unassuming, eager for occult instruction, and ready to work. Though at first, HPB objected to Judge becoming a counselor, yet he won her friendly regard and kept it. He developed leadership and, and became one of the most important figures in the society. Then difficulties arose, and he led the, uh, the sec secession of the majority of the American lodges in 1895. Mr. Judge had been ill for some time from lingering results of Cagas disease contracted in Venezuela. He passed away on March 21st, 1896. So what are their works? Blavatsky followed the instructions of her masters. She worked to see the concepts she had learned from them while in Tibet and throughout her, her life spread. She was the teacher and spiritual impetus for theosophy. Blavatsky taught that the ancient wisdom emphasizes the unity of all life. This we see reflected in the first object of the Theosophical Society. To form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. Well, many of the diverse topics Blavatsky discussed were intricate and at once ancient yet visionary. Her underlying themes were simple, self-knowledge and altruism. Not so simple to attain, of course, but clear as to the goal and how to reach it. She tells us, quote, to live to benefit mankind is the first step. To practice the six glorious virtues is the second. This is from the voice of the silence. To live to benefit mankind could be seen as a goal in itself. One could spend lifetimes working for the benefit of humanity and indeed, this is what is known as the bodhisattva path. The difference being that the bodhisattva has already attained self-knowledge. But for the rest of us, from this first step, from living to benefit mankind, self-knowledge, our true goal is born. For as Blavatsky also tells us in The Voice of the Silence, self-knowledge is of loving deeds, the child. Blavatsky taught that self-responsibility, ethics, and altruism are essential to true spiritual unfoldment. She said that theosophy is altruism, and more specifically that, quote, he who does not practice altruism, he who is not prepared to share his last morsel with the weaker or poorer than himself, he who neglects to help his brother man of whatever race, nation, or creed, whenever and wherever he meets suffering, and who turns a deaf ear to the cry of human misery, he who hears an innocent person slandered, whether a brother theosophist or not, and does not undertake his defense as he would undertake his own, 
is no theosophist, close quote. Our first step then is to live to benefit humanity. The second step, says HPB, is practicing the six glorious virtues. In the voice of the silence, these are listed as Dana, charity and love, Shila, harmony in word and act, Kashanti, patience, Viraga, indifference as to pleasure and pain, Virya, dauntless energy, and Diana, ceaseless contemplation. These lead to the goal, prajna, which can be called the creation of flowering of a bodhisattva. This is a rigorous path, which most of us are not yet ready. But we can begin. We can try, as the master said in the Mahatma letters. In the voice, HPB also speaks of the doctrines of the eye and the heart. Simply put, the eye doctrine is head learning, and the heart doctrine is soul wisdom. We are told to, quote, learn above all to separate head learning from soul wisdom. This is so that soul wisdom has the room to grow. Ultimately, we are to blend thy mind and soul. As even ignorance, is better than head learning with no soul wisdom to alt illuminate and guide it. Of course, all of this leads us back to Blavatsky's emphasis on self-knowledge, responsibility, ethics, and altruism. HPB held a practical view of theosophy to which many of us can relate. She emphasized brotherhood, charity, mutual help, understanding, and goodwill among all. She advocated for the basic laws of life, calling brotherhood a fact in nature. Madame Blavatsky held that the regeneration of mankind must be based upon the development of altruism. The lesson that was constantly impressed by her was assuredly that which the world most needs and has always needed. Namely, the necessity of subduing self and of working for others. In 1890, HPB published The Golden Stairs, perhaps as an act of mercy. At least I'd like to think so, because while still challenging, The Golden Stairs present a simpler means to lead us towards the practice of the paramitas and ultimately self-knowledge. For those of you who might not be familiar with these steps and to refresh the memories of the rest of us, I'll repeat them here. And this is a version that was printed in the collected writings. The Golden Stairs. Behold the truth before you, a clean life, an open mind, a pure heart, an eager intellect, an unveiled spiritual perception, a brotherliness for one's co-disciples, a readiness to give and receive an advice and instruction, a loyal sense of duty to the teacher, a willing obedience to the behests of truth once we have placed our confidence in and believe that teacher to be in possession of it. A courageous endurance of personal injustice, a brave declaration of principles, a valiant defense of those who are unjustly attacked, and a constant eye to the ideal of human progression and perfection, which the secret science depict, uh, depicts. These are the golden stairs, up the steps of which the learner may climb to the temple of divine wisdom. The golden stairs might not give us complete clarity as to how to resolve our day-to-day -day questions or dilemmas, 
but adherence to the steps can help us to practice theosophy in our daily lives, thereby helping to better society, our social condition, and to lift a little of the heavy karma of the world. The influence of Blavatsky's life and her works lived on after her and is still vibrant and very much alive today. Moving on. When the Theosophical Society was founded in 1875, Colonel Alcott was elected president for life. Blavatsky, it has been said, gave us the foundation of theosophy, the spiritual impetus and structure. Colonel Alcott devoted himself to the society. As Mr. Janarajadasa has stated, with Blavatsky alone, there would have been theosophy. But without Henry Steele Alcott, there would have been no worldwide theosophical society. According to Theos Theosophical Wiki, quote, he guarded it jealously from every threat to its existence. He gave his physical strength and the benefit of his wide experience to its organization and his administrative ability to nourish it and foster its growth. For he believed with his whole heart that the good of mankind depended on a channel <clears throat> through which the Brotherhood of Adepts could work to destroy the gross materialism of the day and awaken the spiritual nature of man. To the end, after the founders moved to India, in 1878, he traveled through India and Ceylon in the interests of the society, lecturing on theosophy, trying to get people to see that they could live together in understanding and brotherhood, despite the differences of religious background and race. Colonel Alcott related the tireless wisdom of theosophy, timeless, I'm sorry. Colonel Alcott related the timeless wisdom of theosophy to the cultures of both East and West, applied it to everyday life, and built a society into an international organization. In 1878, the international headquarters of the TS was moved to India. Colonel in Colonel Alcott relinquished the, his flourishing law practice, and in 1882, when the headquarters was established at Alcott, it was purchased almost entirely from his own and Blavatsky's funds. During the years of his presidency, he stood unflinchingly through many upheavals and tribulations suffered by the society. Even after Blavatsky's death, Colonel Alcott bravely continued the work for human brotherhood and understanding. He built the organization of the society into an increasingly useful channel for the master's work in the world. In the Mahatma letters, the masters said of Alcott, quote, him we can trust under all circumstances. His faithful service is pledged to us, come well, Come ill. My dear brother, my voice is the echo of impartial justice. Where can we find an equal devotion? He is one who never questions but obeys, who may make innumerable mistakes out of excessive zeal, but never is unwilling to repair his fault, even at the cost of the greatest humiliation. Cheerfully, who esteems the sacrifice of comfort and even life, something to be cheerfully risked whenever necessary, who will eat any food or even go without, sleep in any bed, work in any place, fraternize with any outcast, endure any privation for the cause, close quote. Colonel Alcott is also credited with reviving Buddhism in Ceylon. 
In old diary leaves, he wrote, this is to certify that on the 19th May, 1880, the founders of the Theosophical Society, Madam H. Plebovatsky and myself, took the Panchasila for the first time at Vijayananda Viharan from Akmemana Dharma Rama Thera. After this, Colonel Alcott became instrumental in creating a renaissance in the study and practice of Buddhism. These efforts were successful and influenced many native Buddhist intellectuals and united the Buddhist sects of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, and later united 12 sects of Japanese Buddhists into a joint committee for promotion of Buddhism. He brought the Burmese, Siamese, and Sri Lankan Buddhists into a convention of Southern Buddhists and formulated the 14 propositions of Buddhism, a document which was the basis upon which the Northern and Southern Buddhists were united. It was during this period that he wrote the Buddhist Catechism, 1881, which was translated into at least 20 languages and 44 editions and is still used today. As a result of the great Buddhist revival, which he began, three colleges and 205 schools were established. Alcott helped financially support the Buddhist presence at the World's Parliament of Religions in Chicago, 1893. The inclusion of the Buddhists in the parliament allowed for the expansion of Buddhism within the West in general, and in America specifically, leading to other Buddhist modernist movements. Colonel Alcott did not confine his activities to strengthening the Buddhist religion. He also worked to revitalize the Hindu religion in India and helped to establish many Hindu schools. He started the Alcott Harajan Free Schools, Children of God, for the benefit of the Panchama outcasts of India. One of these, the Alcott Memorial Higher Secondary School, was established in 1896 near the Ajar compound and is still vibrant and vital today, serving about 400 students. Alcott was also interested in the revival of ancient Zoroastrianism teachings. He wrote a fiery letter to one of their leaders, warning them of the dangers that threatened them as a result of their excessive worldliness and proceeded to make definite practical suggestions for the revival of their religion and their unique culture. Another activity which occupied Colonel Alcott in the early years in India was his energy healing work. He had great mesmeric healing power and was known all over India for effective cures. So many came to him for healing that it finally became necessary to ask the cooperation of the press to make it known that he would only treat such cases as received written permission to be brought to him. Eventually, he was instructed by his master to cease the work because of its drain on his own health and vitality and the fact that his energies must be conserved for the performance of his duties as president. Other work by Alcott included organizing the first exhibit of Indian products that led to the beginning of Swadeshi, later adopted by the Indian National Congress and the founding of the Ajar Library in December, 1886. Colonel Alcott wrote numerous books, articles, and pamphlets that are limited, listed in detail in Alcott writings. Among his writings, the diary series called Old Diary Leaves is especially valued as a first person account of the early days of the Theosophical Society. The Union Index of Theosophical Periodicals lists 830 articles under his name. In his work as a journalist, 
He also wrote for several New York newspapers. Henry Steele Alcott died at the age of 74 on February 17, 1907, at the Ajar compound. There is not much of a record of William Kwan Judge before the founding of the Theosophical Society, but some of the published statements reveal the character of his relationship with Blavatsky during this period. On the occasion of her death, in 1891, he referred to their first meeting in her rooms in January, 1875. He wrote, quote, it was her eye that attracted me. The eye of one whom I must have known in lives long passed away. She looked at me in recognition for that first hour and never since has that look changed. Not as a questioner of philosophies did I come. Not as a questioner of philosophies did I come before her. Not as one groping in the dark for lights that schools and fanciful theories had obscured. But as one who, wandering through the corridors of life, was seeking the friends who could allow where the designs for the work had been hidden. And true to the call, she responded, revealing plans once again and speaking no words to ex explain, simply pointed them out and went on with the task. She looked at me in recognition at the first hour and never since has that look changed. It was teacher and pupil elder brother and younger, both bent on one single end, but she with the power and knowledge that belong but to lions and sages." Close quote. Judge is said to have been a vigorous, imaginative, and idealistic young man. In 1875, he was among the 17 people who first put the Theosophical Society together remaining like HPB and Alcott when others left its ranks. When Blavatsky and Alcott left America, they left Theosophy in North America in Judge's hands. Judge kept in close contact with both Blavatsky and Alcott through correspondence, but there was little, if any, organized activity for the next several years. Of this period, Mrs. Archibald Knightley wrote, Quote, it was a time when Madame Blavatsky, she who was then the one great exponent, had left the field. The interest excited by her striking mission had died down. The TS was henceforth to subsist on its philosophical basis. From this, from his 23rd year until his death, Beth, this is Mr. Judge's death, best efforts and all the fiery energies of his undaunted soul were given to this work." Close quote. In 1885, Judge set about to revitalize the movement in the United States. The real beginning of theosophy in the United States began in 1886 when Judge established The Path, an independent theosophical magazine. Mr. Judge addressed the common man in homely language and with simple reason. In his first editorial, he wrote, quote, it is not thought that utopia can be established in a day, certainly. If we all say that it is useless, nothing will ever be done. A beginning must be made and it has been made by the Theosophical Society. Riches are accumulating in the increase in number. All this points unerringly to a vital error somewhere. What is wanted is true knowledge of the spiritual condition of man, his aim and destiny. Those who must begin the reform are those who are so fortunate as to have been placed in the world where they can see and think out the problems all are endeavoring to solve, even if they know that the great day 
may not come until after their death, close quote. It has been said of Judge, everything he wrote of a metaphysical nature can be found directly or indirectly in the working works of Madame Blavatsky. He attempted no new revelation, but illustrated his own works, but illustrated in his own works, the ideal use of the concepts of theosophical teachings. Judge wrote theosophical articles for various theosophical magazines and also the introductory volume, The Ocean of Theosophy in 1893. He became the general secretary of the American section of the Theosophical Society in 1884 with Abner Doubleday as president. Judge was also vice president of the International Society. In this capacity, he organized and presided over the Theosophical Congress at the World's Parliament of Religions held in Chicago during 1893, Columbian Exposition. Through his writings and extensive lecturing around the United States, he helped make Theosophy known and respected. Blavatsky often referred to the founding of the Theosophical Society as coming about as a result of occult direction from her teachers. Judge would later write that the objects of the society had been given to Alcott by the masters before the meeting at which they were adopted. Thus, the founding of the Theosophical Society may be seen to have been inspired. In 1881, Looking back on the founding of the society, Blavatsky wrote, quote, our society as a body might, be certainly, might certainly be wrecked by mismanagement or the death of its founders, but the idea which it represents and which has gained so wide a currency will run on like a crested wave of thought until it dashes upon the hard beach where materialism is picking and sorting its pebbles, close quote. After Blavatsky died in 1891, Judge became involved in a dispute with Alcott and Annie Besant, whom he considered to have deviated from the original teaching of the Mahatmas. As a result, his association with Alcott and Besant ended in 1895. Most of the society's American section went with Judge. Judge managed his new organization for about a year until his death in New York City, whereupon Catherine Tingley became manager. The organization managed by Judge is known nowadays as the Theosophical Society, but often with the specification International Headquarters, Pasadena, California. Other new organizations split off from his, including the Temple of the People, whose library bears his name, during 1898, and the United Lodge of Theosophists, or the ULT, during 1909. Annie Besant wrote in the June 1909 issue of The Theosophist, William Kwan Judge was a much loved friend and pupil of HPB, and the channel of life to the American branch of the TS, a highly evolved man with a profound realization of the deeper truths of life. He built up the society in America from small and discouraging beginnings. No difficulties daunted him, and no apparent failures quenched his fiery devotion. He was beside HPB throughout, through those early days saw the exercise of her wonderful powers and shared the founding of the Theosophical Society. And throughout the remainder of her life on earth, the friendship remained unbroken. And during the later years, she regarded him as one hope, her one hope in America, declaring that if the American members rejected him, she would break off all relations with them and know them no more. His real work, the spread of theosophy in America, was splendidly performed, 
and his memory remains a lasting inspiration. William Kwan Judge must ever have his place among theosophical worthies. So, these are some facts about the three founders and what they did for in the during their lives and for the promotion of theosophy. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, dear sister Nancy for sharing with us uh, not only very interesting and fundamental facts and uh, moments of the history of the Theosophical Society, but also uh, for uh, this wonderful portrait of our three founders, which allows us to perceive how in the divine plan the threads uh, connect perfectly. And also thank you for those words that make us reflect on the purpose of the Theosophical Society and the attitude that we as members of it can follow. Clearly knowing the lives of people who gave their lives in the for the service of humanity is a point of great, great inspiration for all of us. Nancy's words as always motivate, bring light and leave us with important points to reflect and meditate upon. And in line with this sentiment of inspiration, we would like to share with you a Sanskrit devotional song entitled Ganga Stotram. In the melodious and serene voice of our dear sister Jai Shri Kanan. So now I'm going to share the video with all of you. And uh, okay. Yes. Arini Taral Tarange, Shankara Moli Vihari Nivi Male, Mama Vati Rastam Tava Padakamale, Bhagirati Sukadai Nimata, Tava Jala Mahima Nigame Kyata, Naham Jane Tava Mahimana. Pahi Kripa Mai Mama Nyanam Hari Pada Pada Tarangini Gange Hima Vidu Mukta Tavala Tarange Duri Kuru Mama Dushkruti Bharam Guru Kripa Yabhava Sagara Param Tava Jala Mama Lam Yenani Bitam Paramapadam kalutena grihitam Matar gange tvayo bhakta Kilatam drashtum nayamahasakta Patito darini jana vigange Kandita girivara mandita bhange Bhishma janani he tribuvana kanye Patita nivari nitrubhu anadanye Kalpata miva paladam loke Pranamati astvam napatati shoke Paravara vihari nigange Vimuka yuvati krita tarala pange Vimuka yuvati krita tarala pange Thank you to Sister Yajri for this beautiful song. And uh, well, now we are coming close to the end of today's program. And we want to extend our thanks to Sister Nancy Secrets, International Treasurer, International Secretary of POS, Mrs. Deepa Padi, our International Vice President, Professor Shinde, the chief librarian at the Jar Library and Research Center, Jayajri Kanan from the archives, and all the delegates that joined today, literally for, from all the corners of the world, and who with their presence made this sense of togetherness more vibrant beyond geographical distances and time zone differences. 
So let us take all the inspiration of this commemoration as a guide strength for our daily activities and the week ahead. And before closing the program, we will share a video specially produced by Leap Foundation in India for this auspicious date in which we commemorate 146 years of the foundation of the Theosophical Society. So once again, I share the screen. Well, then with this uplifting energy, once more we thank you, 
to thank to all the participants and to wish you an enlightened rest of day or night and namaste. Bye.